Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for tonight's event with Matteo Ascaripar in conversation with actor Jay Ellis and poet Sasha Banks to discuss Matteo's debut novel, Black Buck. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them from our website by signing up for our email newsletter, as well as following us on social media at BookSoup and following our Crowdcast page here. And you can also check out past events on our YouTube channel. Our next event is scheduled January 15th at 6 p.m. with John Kim in conversation with Mark Groves to discuss Single on Purpose, Redefine Everything, Find Yourself First. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. It's right next to the chat area. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the Like button, and it'll bump it up in the queue. And we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please, as you all are already, please feel free to engage with each other and the conversation and readings in the chat area. Also, please support Book Soup and our authors tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book which you can do by just clicking on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen and it will redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process and it will not interrupt the presentation. So you can do that at any time. And we're also selling digital audiobooks through Libro FM, which I shared a link to at the beginning, but I will send it again. And with that said, let me introduce our guest speakers for this evening. Sasha Banks is a Pushcart nominated poet whose work has been published or is forthcoming in The Atlantic, Vanity Fair, PBS NewsHour, and others. She received her MFA at Pratt Institute. She is a 2019 Rhode Island Writers Colony Fellow and the creator of Poets for Ferguson. She is the author of America Mine. Thank you for being with us, Sasha. Of course. Our in-conversation guest tonight is actor Jay Ellis, who's an actor, producer, director, writer, and philanthropist. He graduated summa cum laude at Concordia University in Portland, Oregon, where he also played basketball and held the position of student body president. He currently stars as Lawrence on HBO's critically acclaimed comedy series, Insecure, in which he won the NAACP Image Award for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series in 2018. Insecure has also been nominated for an NAACP Image Award in the category of Outstanding Comedy Series in 2017 and 2018. As a producer, Ellis recently completed production on the feature film Black Box for Amazon with Blumhouse Productions under his production company banner, Black Bar Mitzvah, which is also in development on feature films at Sony, Netflix, and Warner Brothers, as well as television shows with HBO, Hulu FX, MGM, and more. In 2016, Ellis served as the National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day spokesman and was requested by the Obama administration to speak and moderate a panel at the White House for the final My Brother's Keeper Summit, an initiative created by President Barack Obama to address persistent opportunity gaps faced by boys and young men of color and to ensure that all young people can reach their full potential. He also serves on the board of Inside Out Writers, an LA nonprofit that teaches creative writing classes in juvenile halls throughout LA County. And thank you, Jay, for being with us as well. That was way too long. <laughs> Man, I like, who wrote that? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, worthy things to be sharing. It's amazing work. And our special guest this evening is author Mateo Ascaripor, who is a 2018 Rhode Island Writers Colony writer in residence. And his writing has appeared in Entrepreneur, Lit Hub, Catapult, The Rumpus, Medium, and elsewhere. He lives in Brooklyn, and his favorite pastimes include binging music videos and movie trailers, drinking yerba mate, and dancing in his apartment. Black Buck was his debut novel. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Ask Mateo. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing guest tonight. Thank you all for being with Book Soup, and everyone, please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Sit back and relax. There we go. There we go. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. You didn't have to be here. I know it's nine o'clock. It's late on the East Coast. Um, this is a West Coast event. Thank you to BookSoup for hosting it. And I'm just so excited to have so many people here. Um, for those who attended the first event, you'll know that I created a video um, to premiere, to, to give you the vibe. But the video last time was laggy. And when we tested it for this time, it was also laggy. So I just decided to throw it out. Um, and I'm just going to recite some spoken words for you to kick it off. Um, if you have read the book, you know what the vibe is. If you've heard about the book, you know what the vibe is. But if you're new, 
then all I got to say is if you were sleeping, then now I'm sure you're up because I'm almost sure I'm almost, I almost guarantee they never read anything like black buck. It's a story of a kid smart, but unambitious only cared about his mom, girl and friends doing all he could to grant the wishes. But one day things changed with the arrival of a man who saw something within our character and then began to plan how to teach this kid, inspire and grow his potential for his own gain of the gain of his company. Yeah, you see, it was all mental. As time passed, as it often does, our character went from being Darren a buck, embracing his new name with love, struggling to recreate himself like switching books on his shelf. Yeah, within that struggle were mistakes. You could say he lost his true wealth. But what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world at the cost of his soul? Jesus said that. Something that man Buck was never told. He climbed to the top, higher than the Empire State and even Everest. It was a cold world all the way up there, alone with no one to protect him. But somehow, with the help of friends new and old, he found a way back to who he was. And with a push, he was sold. I don't like who I am. Just another successful token of the words he told himself, staring at his heart, which is more than broken. So our man hatched a plan. I guess you could call it a plot to redefine what it means to be a minority in the workplace. Yeah, there was trouble, a lot. He got what he got and he gave what he gave. There were those who came after him and those he couldn't save, including himself. But let's not get ahead. Black Buck, I promise, the truest thing you've ever read. So just had to clear my throat a little bit for y'all, had to get that out. Um, again, we got a video for that. It'll be coming out on, on social media. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. Now I'm going to read something, but I'm not going to read from the book. Actually, this is a plot twist. Um, I had an event with a bookstagrammer named Pache, uh, also known as Books on the L, the other day, and we were talking about deleted scenes. And I said, "Yo, why am I reading from my book? I understand that that's how it goes at a reading, but why don't I read deleted scenes that didn't even make it into the book?" So shout out to HMH, my editor Pilar. You've never read this, Pilar. My agent, Tina. I don't know if you read this, Tina. It's unedited. Shout out to everyone else from HMH. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your support. Shout out to Adam, to Roy, my uh, film and TV agent, and um, Taryn Roeder, my, my best publicist. Um, but yeah, this is unedited and raw. So I'm just going to kick it off. I don't even have it printed out. I'm just about to read it off the screen. <clears throat> and I'll just let you know, this is an exchange between Darren, before he becomes Buck, and his best friend Jason toward the beginning of the book. Um, and I cut it out because it just felt unnecessary. But here we are. All right, nigga, now this ain't a wire. I ain't here to teach you how to play or give you a speech about how pawns get caps quick and all that noise. You're stupid, I said. What's the count? Jason grabbed two pawns, one white, one black, shuffled them behind his back, and held out two closed fists. Nigga, you know what the count is. 227 to 293, you. Pick. All right, then don't forget it. Your bitch ass is caught up, but I'm still the king. I tapped his left hand, revealing a black pawn. Black, let's go. The sun emerged from behind a pack of clouds. Toddlers and their parents infiltrated Marcy Playground. And older children crossed the tennis and basketball court with colorful backpacks, remnants of sleep still in their eyes. He shook his head while setting up his side. It don't matter, man. Watch. Fifteen minutes later, I had him right where I wanted. I protected my king in the bottom left corner, checked his own with my bishop, and planned to finish him off with revealing my queen. I know pride goes before the fall, but I didn't care. There was no way I could lose. Damn, son. It's about to be 294 to 227. Your month's winning streak is deaded. Tell the folks at home how it feels. Jason kept his eyes on the board, blocking my bishop with a pawn. Salty as hell. Shut up and play, you coconut head having, no deodorant wearing, black Bobby Fisher wannabe. You still talking about that? I forgot to wear deodorant to gym once, son. Once. I moved my queen into position, already picturing how bad I was going to roast him. Without a word, he drove his rook into the position where my queen was, and I quickly returned my queen to her original square, capturing his work. Bad move, Batman. This won't take long. You right. He laughed, slowly grabbing his queen and pushing her down the board onto the square where my own stood. Checkmate, nigga. I bent down to get a better look at the board, trying to figure out how he got me when I had it. Fuck, I whispered. Yeah, Puck is right, he said, grabbing a white pawn and a black pawn. You see, even when I'm white, I play black. 
black plays reserve, like an OG, calmly waiting for your flail and constantly attack and ask to make a mistake, which you always do, because even when you play black, like now, you still play white. That shit will be your downfall, B. Trust. I stared at him, wondering why he was talking all that noise, and laughed. Man, you're starting to sound like Wally Cat. Cut that shit out. He raked the pieces into a plastic bag and rolled up the vinyl board. I'm only saying it because I love you. You know that. Saying what? Someone behind me said, casting a shadow onto the table. Hey, Jay. Hey, Wonder Woman, Jason replied, nodding at Soraya, who wrapped her lotioned arms around me. She smelled like cinnamon and cocoa butter, which almost always made me hard. <laughs> I was just saying that your boyfriend is a bum-ass nigga who can't play chess for his life. That's all. Well, she said, kissing my cheek. He's my bum. Oh, we also got another shipment on that stuff you've been drinking. What is it? I don't know what you're talking about, Jason said, bulging his eyes out. Soraya sucked her teeth. Stop playing. That fermented stuff. Come something. Got the little bacteria floating in the bottom. Kombucha? Almost dropping my jaw onto the table. You out here drinking kombucha and you have the audacity to call me a bum? Son, next thing you know, you'll be rocking Lululemon and using your own shit as fertilizer. Dog, you got jokes, Jason said, rising from the table, but I don't got time for them. I got to hit the corner. I'll check you guys later. Sarai kissed him on the cheek. Bye, Jay. Peace, bro. As I watched him walk out the playground and assume the position on his square, I wondered if he'd ever get what he wanted most, to get off the board. Done. My God. So, yeah, that's a deleted scene. Uh, didn't make the book. We're about to do this conversation with BJ Ellis. I already said it in the chat. There will be no Lawrence Slander tonight. Uh, this is a Team Lawrence event. But um, if you've been to my first event, you know I, I like to introduce a guest with, with a story because the only people I'm having these launch events are with people I know, people I care about, people I have love for, and people who have shown me genuine love and have also read the book very closely. And Jay is one of those people. So I met Jay because we got some, like there's some, there's some stuff going on, let's say in Hollywood, that's all I could talk about now. And Jay got his hands on the book and he hit me up. And I was like, what? So we, uh, we started to talk and he said, listen, man, if you ever need an ear, I'm here. And I was like, let me see if this guy's legit. So we spoke on the phone and we spoke for an hour and we bonded over similar backgrounds um, we bonded over the themes in the book. And as I went deeper and deeper into the world of Hollywood, Jay was always there to tell me how it is, especially from the perspective of a black man in that industry. Um, and I, I was sorely in need of that. And there were times when I thought that I was going to be bugging him by asking for a phone call or texting him. But he was literally always there. He always kept it real with me. Um, he always made himself available. We linked up twice. We had a delicious vegan meal <laughs> once. And, and I was sort of like nervous. I was like, yo, I'm bringing him to this vegan spot right now. He's going to be like, you lettuce eating mother. Uh, but towards the end of the meal, he said, bro, this, this shit is good. And I like wiped a little invisible uh, piece of sweat off of my brow. Um, so big up to Jay. And when I met up with Jay a second time, I was able to meet some of his co-stars for um, Top Gun, which he's in. And these young people looked up to Jay the same way that I do. He was putting them on game right in front of my eyes. And I was like, this, this man keeping the door open for others is not doing it just for one person. He's doing it for many people. Um, so thank you, Jay. And the last thing I'll say is um, shout out to Oprah Winfrey. Oprah is in the chat. If you see someone with the name Candace, that's actually Oprah with a foom. That's a fake Zoom, like a Finsta. So someone, Candace, someone named Candace in the chat is actually Oprah. I just got to let you all know that. Uh, now to turn it over to Jay. My guy. Uh, first of all, thank you for the intro, man. I, 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 I remember sitting down having that meal in New York. I came to see you. We, we linked up and I remember us sitting there having that. And I was like, OK, my man is vegan, so I'm not going to be, you know, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Uh, and then you were like, no, I'm not vegan. I'm just, I was just in the mood for vegan food. tonight. <laughs> but, but I'm was, vegetarian. Was, yeah, that's what it was. But it was great, man. And and getting to getting to know you um, has made my love and experience reading 
the book, I think, so much richer in so many ways. And I'm guessing a lot of people who are getting to see you if they don't know you or getting to hear you talk and getting, you, you know, getting to hear you read that that scene that that didn't make it which I want to get to that at some point. I'm sure they're all feeling the same way I'm feeling. So first of all, thank you and congratulations uh, you, on Black Buck. So so I, I got to tell you, so the first time I read this, and you know this, the first time I read this, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> You're like, this is me. So I was like, this is like, did this dude just take some of my life, my pre-actor life, right? Because I started acting later in my life. And so I had a bunch of different jobs and was kind of plucked from one job because I helped somebody and they were like, yo, I think you can make it in this world. And so when I read this, I was like, yo, I think Mateo knows me. Um, but where where did this come from for you? Like where were you, what made you want to write this? And then I think what made you center this story around Buck, around uh, coming out of, or, or this this metamorphosis rather into Buck? Like what, where did that all start? Yeah, so for me, this um, this story was born out of necessity. I had written two manuscripts, and I didn't achieve my aims with them. I wanted to get an agent. I wanted to have a book deal. But those manuscripts, in hindsight, were just trial and error. They, they, were, my training ground for, they were my training ground for figuring out um, how to write and, and how I wanted to be as a writer. Um, so for me... I hit like a creative rock bottom. I also describe it as effort mode where it was like November, 2018. And I was beginning to doubt myself. Like, why, like, why did I think I could do this? Who did I think that I could come out of the world of sales and startups and then become this writer and, and um, make a mark. And it was in that creative rock bottom, in that state of desperation that I uh, had the idea for a book and it was going to be about, a group of elite black salespeople that were going to train other people, but then honestly be like domestic terrorists and blow up a bunch of shit. Um, And then over the course of months, the idea became refined and I didn't know where this book was going to go, but I knew that I wanted it to be um, about a salesman. I wanted it to double as a sales manual that would um, help black and brown people get ahead in any ways, whether they decided to do um, sales or not. And, um, I chose to focus it in sales specifically, not only because that's what I know very well um, in the world that I come from, but also because I believe that sales is as American as baseball, apple pie, and our original commodity, slavery, right? Like our original trade. Um, And I believe that who who we think of when we think of a salesperson is a direct reflection of who we believe represents America and who we believe represents opportunity. So we've had um, Jordan Belfort. We've had, what's up, brother? I know you were out. I just kept running. I knew you'd come back. All good things come back if you let them go. So (laughs) so, uh, so, um, we've had Jordan Belfort, right, uh, being played by Leo. We've had uh, Alec Baldwin, Glengarry Glenn Glenn Ross. We've had Boiler Room. We've had all of those people. And I wanted to create um, a black, salesperson, a black man, no less, um, for America to root for and at times hate. So Jay, you just hopped back. Let's just say I answered your question in yeah, full. No, I, I, got, I, I heard <laughs> you, even though I froze up, uh, you, you were still going the whole time. So, so, uh, yeah, the word, the word, black answer, don't freeze. The word always gets through, bro. Um, <laughs> <Amen>. we, we, <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you, did you set out, were you thinking satire from the jump? No, and I'm happy you asked that, right? Um, I'm cool with the marketing being like, this is satire. I'm cool with the blurbs being that this is satire. I'm cool with people reading it as satire. Uh, There were definitely satirical elements from the jump, but I wasn't coming into it being like, yo, I'm about to write this crazy satire that's going to be like sort of absurdist and it's going to be X, Y, Z. I won't front. I wrote this very earnestly. Like there are jokes in there. there, there's absurdity, there's hilarity, but for people that have experienced things similar to Buck, they know that it's really not that far-fetched, right? You might not have homie like Clyde trying to translate things into Ebonics while he's like writing a pitch out on a whiteboard, but there have been other things that are seemingly innocuous or mundane that feel as though the Grand Canyon's opening up before you. Right, if you are the resident other in a situation, whether it's due to your race, your sexual orientation, gender expression, uh, or religion, 
you can sometimes feel like your world is cracking in front of you when these little things on the surface happen. Um, so yeah, I knew that I wanted to have some satirical element, but uh, it was important for me to write the truth, write my truth, write a truth that I believe would resonate with the people that I wanted to serve, first and foremost, um, Black people, especially in these environments, and the truth of the world that we live in. Um, now, I, I also will say there's definitely some absurd stuff, but not once. And over the past, like, 25 interviews I've done have people brought up that there's a damn pig in the office. Like, that, to me, is one of the most absurd things. Bruh, there's a damn piglet in the office at the beginning, and within three months, it grows to being, like, a market weight pig. No one has ever brought that up. What's going on with you who's reading the book? There's a damn pig in there. Because it's not that wild when you look at the environment in some ways, uh, which is which is its own. <laughs> When you look at the when you look at the environment, but yo, so let me ask you this: so, so in in knowing that, how many how many of these characters are people in your own life? Woo! And, who, and who of those people have read the book and been like, "Oh, that's who you think I am"? Oh, good God, brother! No one's asked me that because I've been good at dodging it, to be <laughs> honest. Or I've been good at like misdirection or like trying to like juke them. But um, let me say this. <laughs> this book, um, I will cite my disclaimer. This book is a work of fiction, and <laughs> any people who are real or otherwise depicted in this book are depicted fictitiously in this work of fiction. Now that now that we got through that, um, the people in this book. All right, let me bring it back. There are many people who I know who are like, bro, am I in your book? Or like, bro, I've seen this like character that you depicted. Is that me? And I've come to learn that um, either people are just very self-centered or they want to be in this narrative. They want to believe that they were interesting enough to be in my book. Um, and most of them weren't. And why? Because I didn't want to be inundated with a bunch of people being like, yo, I'm in there. Yo, this is me. Um, even though people will still think that. So what did I do? I created composite characters. It could have been a mix out of people who I knew or people that I made up or someone that I saw in a movie or someone that is just honestly a stereotype. And if I started from that stereotype with some characters, especially with the people at someone, I made sure to add depth to them. That they're not, for example, Clyde, right? And I want this to be yeah. as, small, as spoiler free as possible. Clyde is your waspy dude. He rocks Dockers, Sperry's, Brooks Brothers. He got a vest. He's from Greenwich, Connecticut. But you see, Clyde consoling people in the book. You see his softer side. You see the love, the, the, the brotherly and male love that he has for another man and other people, um, which you typically wouldn't see if I just adhered to a stereotype. But just so I keep it a buck and so I don't completely dodge your question because I'm trying to not be a politician. I'm trying to keep it real. Um, there are relationships in this book, just a few that are inspired from relationships that I've had with people in my real life. And those people, when they read it, will know who they are. And uh, that's all I'll say. Fair enough. We don't want to blow your spot up any, any, any more than you're already doing by publishing a, a, a book that's going Word. across the world. We're not going to blow Word. your spot up anymore. So, Word. I, all right. So, so I, I, obviously, we don't want to give away any spoilers. You know what I'm saying? We want to keep it. We, we want everyone to, uh, to find some of these things on their own, obviously, and read these things on their own. But can, can you talk about there's... There's two big moments in the book that I would like to talk about. Um, right. I mean, there's actually a bunch of them, but we don't got that kind of time. But there's two moments. Yeah. One, there's a chosen moment. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about that and just what and and because that often happens in a lot of ways in Black culture, where one is chosen to 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 be uh, let in the room, if you mm -hmm. will. Can you kind of talk about? about that a little bit and how you kind of crafted that initial meet and then how yeah. that became, you know, obviously that character's, that character's new, moves into that new environment. Yo, everyone look at Jay. Jay is smooth right now. Cause I see him like being vague on purpose when he wants to talk about it. Also, I forgot, shout out to Kosoko. Kosoko Jackson got a book coming out and he's a big fan of yours, Jay. I Maybe. told him that we'd give him a shout out. Kosoko Jackson. Remember that name. He got a book coming out. Yesterday is history. That's my boy. So, um, all right. The moment that Jay's talking about, and, and I feel comfortable bringing this up because when people say, tell me what your book is about, I've been saying in interviews. But basically, um, 
Rhett Daniels, the CEO of this startup called Someone, comes downstairs to the Starbucks that Darren's working at in the same building. And he says, give me my regular. Darren, for some reason, says no. The dude, Rhett, is like, mother, give me my regular now. But Darren flips it on him and he sells him a new drink. So Rhett, impressed, invites Darren up to the 36th floor and gives him the opportunity to join his company, someone, and gives him, as Jay said, that opportunity to join uh, the sales team specifically. Darren reluctantly joins, and then he realizes he's not the only black salesman there. He's the only black person in the entire company. So for me, um, even though that wasn't my experience, I was one of a few black people and one of like two black directors. Uh, on, on the sales team at this company. Um, I wanted to make him the only one to show that narrative that we've seen all too often and that many of us have lived, the token, right? And Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, um, who wrote Americana and, and many other books, Half of Yellow Sun, um, We Should All Be Feminists, all those great things. She has a TED talk about the danger of one story. Right, because it's very easy to say, yo, we let this one black or brown man, woman, um, however they identify person in. So this is progress, right? When that is actually detrimental to progress because this one person, right, and while they could be a great person, um, they don't they don't meet it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you fix your diversity and inclusion issues. Having this token to point to um, if you actually in your environment just have one person makes you actually look bad. And I think that a lot of people are starting to realize if they didn't before all those marketing materials when you're like, Hey, we got Jerome, look, we got Jerome. It's cool, bro. We should actually do something where we look at all those old marketing materials and, and, and go find Jerome and ask him, how is he? What's up? Um, Jerome so is going to be mad popular after this, after this, after this talk. <laughs> It could be it could be Jerome, it could be Mateo, it could be Jay, it could be Sasha, it could be anyone, you know what I'm saying? We we know these people. Um so I wanted to have Darren be the only one to show how he would fare in an environment as hostile and as aggressive as sales and startups and also what it would do to him. We see Darren change. Again, if you haven't read the book, you already know Darren is going to change. And in many ways it's not for the better. And this was no far-fetched situation. This happened to me. This happens to many people. When you realize that you have to change in order to not just survive, but thrive, right? To get the promotion, to be palatable to the majority of other people, to be well-liked. And in many situations, you just take it until you can make it. I think especially as a man, right? You're like, yo, I got to man up. Yeah. You don't want to be an X, Y, Z, insert inappropriate word, right? Like, don't be a whatever. I just got to man up and take it until I make it. But I think that um, many of us have done that for far too long, and we see how it plays out in the book. And the final thing I'll say at this point is I was talking to my mom after the election was reconfirmed or recertified, and my mom was like, the big and the small. We have taken the big and the small for so long, the big and the small. And it's been time for it to be all out in the open. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book. And that's why I, I set up such a pivotal moment where Darren is given an opportunity. And in Darren, Rhett sees a reflection of himself, but he also sees the opportunity uh, to better his company. As I said in that verse at the beginning, right? And in Rhett, Darren, he doesn't know it at first, but subconsciously, he sees a way to fulfill the potential that so many people says that he has. Now let's talk about that moment a little bit, that Darren to black buck moment, that, that, yeah. that look in the mirror moment where it's just like, yo, I'm a whole new person here. I'm going to take on this persona and I'm going to, I'm going to lean into this and make it work for me. Uh, can you just talk about crafting that a little bit? And, and was there any personal experience that you used there or was that, you know, or was it drawn from, you know, again, from friendships, from relationships, from composites of, of different characters and, and kind of talk about, I mean, we know obviously that Darren's going to go on this journey, but can you, it doesn't feel like it's too much of a spoiler, but can you talk about, you know, that moment and that decision for him to lean in? Yeah. Well, I think that we see in the book, it's not just one moment, it's a series of moments. This type of thing is gradual. And it wasn't possible to play it all out in the book. Um, some things do feel like, oh, 
it's just like, you know, in a couple of pages, it jumps a little bit. I had to do that. When I finished this book, it was 168,000 words. It's over 500 pages. What you all or some of you are holding in your hands today or have ordered is in the mail or whatever, uh, maybe you're using it as a doorstop, right? That's like 110,000 words around there, 113,000. So I couldn't include the, why, the breadth of it all. But you'll still see in the book, it's gradual. Um, you see it where Darren enters, it's deals week. He's broken down, right? There's, there's a part where this is like one of the only spoilers I'm going to give where um, someone says shh, shh, to Darren at when Darren's crying after a very serious role play. And he says, finally, a broken buck. Like, yo, what? A broken buck, right? Like talking about the animal now. And, and breaking horses. So Darren is broken down in that first week, but um, that's very intentional in a lot of organizations. That's something that I'm not gonna front. I used to actually do with salespeople as well. It's like psychological warfare, where I would try to break them down from the jump, from the interview, and then build them back up. Why? Because in my mind, even though it was somewhat um, malicious, I thought that I'd be helping them in the long run because what they were going to experience, and Clyde says this in the book, what they were going to experience on the sales floor of calling 200 people up and literally not reaching anyone, maybe for days, and then having to contend with the fact that their quota is up on the wall for everyone to see and they have a big fat zero or a goose egg, as we'd say. I thought that I was toughening them up, but it wasn't always the best way. Um, but in terms of those series of moments, right, we see Darren get broken down, then we see him uh, become built up. We see them hit their number when they thought they weren't going to hit their number. And that, again, I'm trying to stray away from uh, the company that I used to work because this book is not about where I used to work, even though it's set in the same office. Shout out to everyone who I used to work with that is in here or who, or who has read the book. I love you all so much. You put your faith in me when I was a young man and I was still trying to figure things out um, as a leader. And um and yeah, I just, I have so much support from the people I used to work with and they've helped me out in many ways. So shout out to you. But for the people in the audience who I used to work with, they would know that we would have new hires come in and we would do, I'd lead a stretch. I, I typically don't talk about this, but we're keeping it a buck. I used to lead a stretch like you see in the book with 90 salespeople at the height of it. And these were 90 aggressive, intelligent, fierce people that every day I'd have to corral in a circle and then stretch and then deliver a spiritual message at the end, basically, to get them all pumped up. So imagine me. I'm a young buck. No pun intended. I'm 20. I'm 24 at this time. I got to corral these 90 people. I got to get them to close their eyes and do other stuff that we're not going to discuss here because that's just for us. And, um, and then get them amped up. So uh, what we would also see, though, is the new hires would come in and they'd be like, what? What is going on here? Like this place is sort of wild. And then it'd be the end of the month and we think we're not going to hit our goal. And then when we hit, in that moment when we would hit, I would literally see people's faces melt and become believers. And we see that in the book too. So to answer your question, Jay, there were many moments. There's Buck being broken down. Right. There, there's them hitting their number and him realizing that, that he's a believer. There's getting this male affection from someone like Rhett who's very touchy. And Darren... And we also know, like a lot of us, it's not like you're touching, right? It's just like, yo, what up, right? Or like, you know, like we're dapping. There's, we we well, become better about it. Well, we become not better not about it. it. We become better about it. But there's not a lot of like hugging. And Darren receives a lot of male affection and like literal touch when he starts working in this startup. So it's just a series of, of many things that brought him to, to becoming Buck and believing in the church that is someone, the name of the startup. Um, for all you guys out there watching, you have questions, make sure to ask us uh, in about five minutes. I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask all your questions and start digging through those. You guys, um, Mateo, talk to me about. OK, so this moment, uh, this is the moment, this this final kind of moment it is is a spoiler for sure. So I don't want to give it away. But yeah. there, there's something that comes back in Buck's life. Sure. Um, and. And we don't see it coming. Yep. Why? What, what, what was your intent there? Why, why did you yeah. want to? And for those of you who have read the book, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't read the book, I'm telling you when it comes, it hits you like a train. You don't even see it coming. Um, and, you're, and you're shocked by it. But you're also in some in, in an odd way 
uh, you're 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 satisfied by it as well. Like yeah. you, you, I mean, you understand it. You know what I mean? But yeah. why? What what was your intent there? Why did you why did you put that moment in there? It's a it's a it's a a karmic moment, if you will. Yeah, man. Um, it was unplanned, and um, I give myself some kudos to not restraining myself too much while writing this book. People who read it can feel that I had a ton of fun. I also had many difficult parts in the book, right? With um, subjecting Darren to the overt racism and then in turn having him hurt other people, other black or brown people in his life who loved him unconditionally. It was not easy for me to do that because um, this is a book, sure, but many of us see ourselves or our families or relatives or people whom, whom we know reflected in these characters. So it wasn't easy. Um, but I bring this up to say that I didn't, I didn't plan like that, that person or that thing that comes back. I didn't plan that initially. Um, the book, I knew from the first page, the biggest twist. And I had to figure out how to get him there. And while I was writing this book, I was still living at my parents' house. And we're about to keep it real. I'm about to be a little crass. So don't hold me. Apologies in advance. But I was sitting on the toilet at my parents' house. And I was like, yo, how do I get this guy this big twist? And then I thought about Boardwalk Empire. I loved Boardwalk Empire on HBO with Steve Buscemi. And I thought about something that happened to our main character in Boardwalk Empire. And I said, oh, I'm going to do something similar, but very different and it and it's going to feel right in the world of buck um so that's all that's all i'm gonna say i love it yeah. um one last thing uh and then we'll jump into some questions so guys make sure you drop some of your questions down there i see some of them already but um let's talk about buck infiltrating the system mm -hmm. and kind of turning it on its head a little bit um it's interesting because of the time that we're in, even more specifically, right? I think yeah. it's such an interesting thing to your point about a lot of companies kind of looking and realizing that they may only have a person of color or very few people of color in their office and what that actually means for their uh, 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 diversity recruitment um, and, and all of those things. Let's talk about that moment. Let's talk about, not that moment, obviously, because mm -hmm. it's it's bigger than a moment, but let's kind of talk about that. Is that something that you wish that you did? Is it something that you did? Is it something like, where did that kind of, where did that kind of originate? Yeah, it, uh, it, it definitely comes from the wish that I had done more when I was this director of sales development, right? I, I hired um, a handful of black and brown people, right? But when I was there, bro, it was like I was in the sunken place. I had power, I had money. It was like OJ. Simpson syndrome. I'm not black. I'm OJ, you know? And then every once in a while I was hit with the reality that I was like, Oh shit, actually what? But, um, but I wish I had been the uh, black leader that those specific employees needed because sometimes they would come to me. Um, and I know that they were coming to me for very specific reasons, but I was on some, yo, you need to hit your number. And this is how I'm going to help you hit your number. But I wasn't, treating them as the whole person that they were, especially as, as, as a fellow uh, black person that was coming to me on some, yo, I got to keep it real with you. I think that something wrong is happening in this specific scenario, whatever. So with this book, it's not an attempt at like re redemption or righting a wrong, like that would be sort of foolish. But I was like, yo, how cool would it be if I could write this in a way that it would double as a sales manual so that anyone, but especially black and brown people would be able to read it, get some gems, and maybe hop into sales if they want in an entry level sales role, or um, possibly more realistically, just have some gems on how to advocate for themselves better. Whether it means an interview, a bigger salary, um, whether they're in a scenario where they need to advocate for their family related to like, like healthcare in the hospital or, or anything, they could take some gems and some empowerment to give them the confidence that they need to say when they feel that something is wrong, yo, this isn't right, and I'm gonna speak up. Or to also just know that we are valuable and our value needs to correlate with our salary, with the way people treat us, with the way people speak with us, with people thinking twice before they say something slick. 
So that was the idea. And that's why I wrote the book in this way. And yeah, Buck, it goes back to the title. He's, he's coming with that Black Buck energy. Many of us know who the Black Buck was, right, historically. Um, he was the enslaved individual who was up in there. The enslavers were afraid that he was going to burn down the whole damn plantation, uh, steal the women, steal the animals, including pigs. Shout out to pigs again. Um, and, and just really mess things up. And Buck is doing the same in this book. He's not burning it down, per se, in terms of these organizations, but he's burning down what they sound and uh, what they stand for. And listen, I'll say people do slash and burn, right, for their crops for a reason. You got to burn it for shit to grow. Um, yeah. I love it. I love it, bro. Um, I know we have we a got really- Sasha. Sasha got to run up in here, right? We got a really special guest that, that, that we got to get to. Um, you want to introduce her? Because you, you guys got a friendship. You guys go back. Yeah, Sasha is the homie. So Sasha is a fellow Rhode Island Writers Colony sibling. And let me try to keep it brief because Sasha got to get to her joint. She got to blow you to smithereens with her words. Um, I first met Sasha at an alumni weekend for our Rhode Island Writers Colony. The alumni come up for one of the weekends that the, uh, the members of the colony are there. And we get to see them read in front of people. And when I saw Sasha read, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe that these people and her cohort, Jive, Alicia, um, Jill, when I heard these people read, I said, yo, I am so proud to be a part of uh, this colony, but also just here to witness it. And then I got to know Sasha better and I got her book called America Mine. And if you think I snapped in Black Buck, (laughs) Sasha snapped five times as hard in her book of poetry. She really is not holding anything back in a way that inspires me to go harder. And the last thing I'll say is during our, during our alumni weekend, we were having some fun. We, partake, we partook in a few things and <laughs> I became very hungry. And then all of a sudden I hear the door swings open from the house that we were just hanging in. <laughs> and someone says, y'all want cobbler? <laughs> Wait, what? Y'all want cobbler? Hell yeah, I want cobbler. Yo, I ran up in that house and Sasha had peach <laughs> cobbler with the with the fumes and everything flying off. And she handed right. me a slice. And good <laughs> Lord, with a T at the end, it was the best <laughs> cobbler I, I've ever had. So Sasha, I didn't tell you this, but we got to go into business and, and start a, start something called poetry and peach cobbler. I will be your, your venture capitalist, but the good kind. All right, without further ado, Sasha Banks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mateo, for um for asking me to be here. I'm so happy and excited to celebrate your book with you. So congratulations on everything that's happening. I just really feel like the book is going to sweep and I'm I'm happy to watch it happen. I'm gonna read two. Is that okay? Okay, cool. I'll read them fast. Okay, the first one from the book is called um, Post Collapse. You will remember nothing but the taste of salt and how it's in everything and how it never changes even though everything else does. And so you will cry and cry and be fed. A woman will stand in the street and open her mouth one summer night, noiseless for hours until she wretches up a star, hot thing covered in mucus. I wanna say something like, it turns out that the sun had a face which implies a mouth that knew all your names. But the truth is there will never have been any sun, only the North Star after all. It will fall down and land behind a woman's house in Detroit. It will be dark for weeks and everyone's eyes will glow. Here and now will be the faded kind of memory like waking from a dream that loosens its grip as you become wider and wider awake. At the grocery store, you will hear someone whistling the old anthem. They will not be able to remember more than Oh, say, can you? Nobody will. Such is the case with ruins, ancient histories, blurry faces everywhere smeared by the fists of their conquerors. Before today and statues will be plucked from their high places all over the country. This should be the first sign, but whiteness will not see itself in this sure demise. They will learn. There will be no flag anymore. Many will dream of eagles eaten by crows, pecked to death by crows, 
a woman will tell of seeing a crow pulling all the feathers from a dead eagle. None will remember this time, but the crows will. And so they will eat the grudge for your sakes. America will be done. And you will know it when the Statue of Liberty sits down to wash her face in the Hudson. Her skin will be black. Your grandmothers will weep. And I have one last one. And this one is called, I thought I could wish for trouble and it would not come after Ajua agrees. An open mouth begats all futures. Ours will begin with a death, the signature blood of an ending. I was just a woman twisting her hair in the kitchen, suddenly daydreaming of a row of drinking glasses dangling off the edge of a dining room table, obsessed with the slowing second before the sound. In December, I stood in front of a US map confessing to it, I don't want a country, only the land beneath it and watched it fall to dizzy pieces. In March, everyone I loved hid their bones in houses. Death screamed faceless in the night and no one slept in April. My heavy head forgets about seasons, even as the earth heals without us, even though my body weaves some new trauma, I cannot begin to unravel until it is the garment I wear under my clothes for the rest of my life. I want to hold my lover in May. My trembling hands know he is missing from me. I chew a watermelon rind and wonder if his body has begun to mourn my living flesh. I have craved endings in my sleep while resting on the supposition of children, a well body, some vindicated heart unscathed in the midst of a chaos I have called to me like a vulture to my steady arm. I am not God. I am not a patriot, just seething and exhausted. And that is all it takes to wish for trouble. The trouble is we are all reaping. Thank you. So, Yo, there was no hyperbole in what I said about <laughs> Sasha snapping. Thank you, Mateo. Please, please get America mine to read the rest. Follow Sasha on all things. Sasha and I actually started out the day with something very meditative. It was poetic and writing a series of sentences, just beginning with I have. Woo! Sasha, <laughs> man. Sasha. Wow. Thank you for waking um, up with me this morning. Thank you for popping I in. I saw you. I said this is the best way to wake up um, with a little <laughs> Sasha time and poetry. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, Sasha, for being here. Um, thank you for right. being a, a great friend and someone who's so encouraging. And um, I'm just so excited for, for the future for both of us. Um, question time, my man, Jay, I didn't know Jay was summa cum laude. My man just brought that out there in his bio, like none. Um, <laughs> Jay, Jay is here, uh, to now help us with the questions. My man. Let's do it. Um, all right. So we're going to jump in. Uh, I'm going to give some people some time. <laughs> that way, if their questions are wild, they get called out. Hey. Um, <laughs> Robert Jones Jr. asked, what did you fear about writing this book and what are your hopes for it? What, if anything, did you learn about yourself after completing it? Robert, yo, this is Robert's book right here, The Prophet. I put that there on purpose. Both of our books came out on the same day. Uh, that is my book, brother. He has been someone to lean on. But to answer your question, Robert, um, what was I afraid of? Well, this book is, it, it's like a face tattoo, man. There's no going back. People know who I am now, and they know what I'm about. If there was ever a question before, especially people who knew me back in the day of where does this man stand um, on all of these topics that aren't just of this moment, but are connected to many moments stretching back hundreds of years. Now, you know, now, you know, whether you read the book or not, you know. Um, so so a fear, though, was putting that stake in the ground. I needed a requisite amount of courage. And I, I drew it from many different places, um, but we don't have the time on all these inspirations. But yeah, man, I needed I needed a lot of courage to be able to just uh, to put it out there. What do I hope for? I hope that this makes people feel less alone. I hope that um, 
people realize, and in the words of my friend Candace, real Candace, not Oprah, who's here parading as someone named Candace, but real Candace, I hope people read this book who have been in these scenarios and have felt like the only one and know none of us are crazy. None of us are crazy. When we think something's up, we are not paranoid. We are not overly sensitive. We are not um, someone who needs to be gaslit by, yo, it was all a joke, bruh. Like, no, none of us are crazy. Um, and I also want um, other people, especially non-Black people, to read the book and engage in some ruthless and unflinching self-examination of what is their role in this specific narrative? Who do they see themselves reflected in and how does that make them feel? And also, what is their role in the narrative of this nation and world? And, and what, are, what, what are they playing um, or not playing in the fight for progress role? Um, so that's, that's what I say, uh, my man, Robert. Um, I love that. And it's interesting because it leads right into our next question, bro. So the book, um, this is from Gal. Uh, and if I'm messing that up, it, it is also G-O-W. Gal. Okay, yeah. so, okay, Gal, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get called out for messing nobody's name up tonight. Uh, but the book highlights many issues that black people may encounter, especially in a professional space that is not diverse. And although you wrote the book for a black audience, what are some things that you would want white readers to get out of this book? Uh, and do you view this as a book that would make them more aware of our struggles? Shout out to Gal. Um, Gal is my boy. Gal was actually like the second or third reader of this book ever. Like back when it was super long. He's a lawyer, so let's get it right. Um, and Gal was one of the only two black people out of like 49 in his incoming class of, uh, of lawyers where he's working now. So Gal knows what the deal is. And I had Gal in mind when I was writing this book. Um, but in terms of what I want um, white people to take away, it goes back to what I said. I want um, them to hopefully perform some self-examination. Many of them are, right? I'm not here saying, oh, y'all got to do, you know, uh, more work than you're doing because I'm not the authority and I don't know where you are at in your life, right? But if I can speak generally, um, I want there to be an honest reckoning um, with those times that you've been complicit with those times that you have said things, with those times that you've heard things and maybe you've never said things, but you heard things and then sort of like let it slide because it's awkward as hell to have these real conversations with people you know. So that's what I would hope. And would it, um, do I think that this will highlight um, some of our struggles? For sure, I think it will, but it's also gonna highlight our joy and our triumph because our lives are not just full of doom and gloom and tragedy and trauma, we are so much more. And I know that what connects us as black people is the fact that um, not all of us, but many of us were just yoked up and put on a boat and then taken over to this hemisphere, right? It happened to your people, Jay, it happened to my people. Um, but what also unites us is how resilient we are, how joyous we are, how, 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 how much good we create out of a bad situation. Um, I'll also say, Gal, straight up, I'm no one's tour guide. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't write this book to try to be someone's tour guide into blackness. Um, I can't do that. And if I tried, I would have failed. So I, that wasn't my intention. But yeah, people are definitely going to be take be taken away some new knowledge from this. I hope. Um, Reggie Bailey asks: Are there any books you think Black Buck is in conversation with? Reggie set me up because he already knows that's Reggie reads everybody. I gave him a shout out last time. Reggie reads is my brother. Shout out to all the bookstagrams. We got a Keely in here. We got other people I haven't seen. Man, um, black bookstagram, non-black bookstagram, but especially black bookstagram gives me life. Um, in terms of books that black book is in conversation with, the spook who sat by the door, I actually read that towards the end of last year and I couldn't believe it. It felt as though I was just reading a different iteration of black book. And that book was written in 1969 by Sam Greenlee, um, there's a movie that came out, I believe, in the 70s. Uh, Lee Daniels, I think, is going to adapt it into a series. Um, man, the spook who sat by the door. Oh, shit, we got Joy in here. Yo, smile, it's Joy. Shout out to Joy. She's also an incredible bookstagrammer. We're talking on the rag. She keeps me in check. What's up, Joy? Um, but yeah, the spook who sat by the door. Angry Ones by John A. Williams, which I don't always recommend because there's some questionable language in there. There's questionable language in mine too, but whenever anyone asks me about it, there's context. There's a reason I put it in there. 
Um, and just a little bit of the language and the angry ones. I was like, Ugh, ah, I love you, John A. Williams, but ooh, this is this is tough. But yeah, the angry ones. If he hollers, let him go by Chester Himes. Um, How to Make a Slave by by Gerald Walker. Um, I read that recently, and that that definitely spoke to it. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a, a ton of books, you know. Yeah, that, that's what I'll say for now. Um, I feel like that's always a tough question because if you say something wild, people are gonna be like, "Wait, what?" I know, I know. <laughs> One, let me just add the street by Ann Petrie too. You know, her her protagonist was a domestic in Connecticut, and um, I think I think that Ann Petrie would have would have dug this book. I hope. Um, back on the book. So as as Darren is becoming buckified, if you will. Ooh, uh, nice. Uh, this is uh, Ben Bernstein gave us that one. Uh, it's, up, it's, you know, he seems very unaware of the emotional effect that he's having on those close to him. Was he just too caught up in the tsunami of corporate whiteness? And I'll add to that question, or was he protecting himself in a way? I, it, it was definitely more the former. He got caught up. We all get caught up. Think about this. Darren is thrown into a scenario where he's going from making like $19,000 a year to 65,000. He's having catered lunches. He's having all of these people that eventually big him up and go to bat for him early on in the book to say that you are different, <clears throat> but you are one of us. Darren is being accepted into a world so unlike his own that he gets high off of it. And he's also in sales. For anyone who's been in sales, you know what I'm talking about. Yo, if you call up someone, across the country who doesn't expect your call. And I'm like, hey, this is Mateo Kong from Black Buck Enterprises. How are you, Sally? And I keep Sally on the phone for like 30 to 45 minutes and she's a powerful executive. And she ends up giving me her credit card, right? Not for anything little, but for like a $10,000 deal. Or she sets time to speak with an account executive or someone else. How can you not get high off of that? That's crazy. And it happened to me. I used to make tons of sales calls to CEOs, to directors, then senior vice president, and I was controlling them from the jump. And I was 22, 23, 24. You feel as though you can do anything, that you are invincible. And all of that happening to Darren and him getting caught up and the money and the flashy things, he's going to clubs, his life in bed -Stuy, especially when people are trying to keep him in check, doesn't look as good anymore. And when people are like, yo, nigga, I know who you are. He's like, actually, you don't understand. You're still on the corner or you're still doing X, Y, Z. I'm going to the top in Manhattan. You know what I'm saying? He, he takes on this elitist attitude that we've seen time and time and time and time again with many people um, and many people in our community. So he just gets caught up. It's as simple as that. And I think it happens to the best of us and it happened to me and I'm certainly not the best of us, so. Um, Christy asks, there's a quote out of the book here. Qu Christy asks, in the book, what did you mean by if you are saving them money and time, there should be no reason they don't sign? Ah! Yeah, yeah, that's just some like crazy sales stuff. Uh, I mean, the, the thought is right with sales that much of it comes down to time and money, right? If, if I come to you and say, for example, let's say, Christy, that um, you, and this is really the first thing that comes to mind, my bad, but you want to, you know, you want to clean your house, you clean your house every Sunday, and uh, let's, let's, let's break out of this. Let's say your husband, right? Just to make it interesting and more realistic, you know, now with where we are. Your husband cleans the house every Sunday, right? And he's getting down on his knees and he's wiping everything down. What if I roll up, ding, 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 I knock on the door. Hi, my name is Mateo from, from bettercleaning.com. You know what, can I show you my wares? And then you're like, get out of here. But then I say, hold on, what if I could tell you that I could save your husband, Craig, 30 minutes every Sunday and a lot of knee pain down the line and a potential knee surgery by just selling you this product for $30, it's a vacuum and a washer or wiper all in one. I just made this up and it's going to save you all this time and money on surgeries down the line. It would be a no brainer, Christy. So if you bring the sale down to saving someone time and money and makes it far easier for them to say yes, because it's going to directly benefit their lives in a tangible way. 
You know what I've used uh, since I read this book? And I even, I, I, I tried it on you once. You remember this? And you called me Yeah, out. I do remember when you texted me, yeah. <laughs> I'm fair. Yeah, so Mateo, That's everyone's favorite. <laughs> so Mateo sends me a text message one day asking me something and I, I reply back to him and I'm like, yo, I'll get you an answer in like a day or two. Is that fair? <laughs> I said, yeah, I didn't know you read that book. Fair. I said, that sound fair. That's what I said. <laughs> I love it. I use it all the time. And it's great because you're right. Nobody wants to ever feel like they're the unfair person. It's wild how you how it shifts conversations. It is educational. I mean, you you, you, you give a lot of gems, man, from your experience. Right. Yeah, right. Buck does, uh, rather. Um, all right, so Troy Williams this is a friend of mine. Uh, he actually sent Hold me- Hold on, a, you know Troy? Yeah, he sent me a text message today, bro, with like the book and the car. Hey, and the car. You never told me you knew Jay. Troy and I have been rapping via Instagram. I didn't know he knew you, that's what's up. Yeah, man, that's my guy. Good dude, good dude. Um, Mateo, straight from the book, reader, watch closely and take notes. Sales isn't about talent, it's about overcoming obstacles, beginning with yourself. Page 246, what did you need to overcome to write Black Buck in the voice that you felt was authentic to yours? And he says, uh, I love this book, as you know, five stars, Troy. Thank you, Troy. Um, I had to overcome thinking that I needed to be a certain way or be a certain person or write a certain way to get into this industry. I came in thinking that I had to be buddy, buddy with the who's who of the literati whether it's on social media or people that got New York Times bestsellers. I was sending everyone emails. I said, Viet Tin Wen, an email who wrote The Sympathizer. He actually got back to me. He said, bro, I don't have time for you because I don't have time for my own family, but good luck. And that meant a lot to me. Um, so I thought that I had to be with the who's who. I thought that I had to sell my personality in order to get my foot in the door. Um, I thought that I had to write um, sentences that adhered to the books that I grew up reading, you know, from the so-called canon, if we're talking like Steinbeck, Faulkner, all these types of things. I never read Faulkner, but I'm talking about Steinbeck, um, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, people like that. So it was having to overcome all of that in my own mind and be like, yo, write the book that you want to serve the people that you want it to serve in your own way and in your own voice. Um, that I, that's the point that I had to get to, Troy, in order to write this book. I'm going to do two more questions just because I know we've, yeah. we've been going and your time is valuable, man. Everybody wants to talk. Uh, my man, my Come man. On, bro. Hey. Uh, are there any industries where you're hoping Black Buck will particularly disrupt, be, disru be disruptive, excuse me, to the system uh, that in reading this story, Black readers will be inspired to enter that industry? That is from Marika Stewart. That's my cousin. What's up, Kika? What's up? Right. We spoke earlier today. That's my cousin. Um, and that's a great question. I've never been asked that and I've never thought about it. Um, no, I don't have any specific industry in mind. Of course, I think where it's most relevant is regarding tech. And I'm actually going to be speaking at a lot of different tech companies um, next month because they also see the value in having their employees read a book like this to facilitate conversations. Um, but yet, I don't know. I don't know where, where the book could go. Um, I don't know. There could be someone who's in law who, said, who says, I read your book and, and it's helping me reimagine you know, my own place. There could be someone who um, is a doctor. I don't really know where it could go, but I hope that it spreads widely and I hope that it touches a lot of people in a lot of different places. All right, this is our last question and then I'm going to bring Sam back on. Uh... In your journey from salesman to author, what would you say was paramount to you making that transition that you think could be of service to someone trying to make the same transition? That's from Jared P. Woods, a black man reading. I love it. I love That's it. That's my man, yo. That's my man. He, he, him and Reggie are, are 4 p.m. on Sundays. That's Sunday service, everyone. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look them up on Instagram. They're doing that every Sunday. But um, what did I think? Yo. Sorry, I'm, I'm laughing because my man told a funny story about him working at McDonald's the other day. But um, the ability to fail over and over and over and over and over again and not let it deter you from, from your big picture aim, that is what I would say helped me most. There was a lot that, that I took from the world of sales that didn't serve me. I came into this 
writing those first two manuscripts, thinking that I was a man, thinking that I, someone got to give me a book deal because I'm writing the best thing ever. And I was humbled, necessarily so, many times. But never did I let rejection deter me from the main goal. And that's something that we as salespeople, no, that sounds so weird to say, we as salespeople, but, but that we're taught because, because, <laughs> <laughs> because you cannot survive in sales if you get down about every short-term loss. You got to keep the long-term in your foresight or else you're not making bread and you will be embarrassed. And depending on where you work, you will be embarrassed in front of many people. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just pulling up IG so I can follow a black man reading right now. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and, and all these all these books, the grammars, man, they uh, it's, it's just incredible. Just want to make sure I get my education on. Um, hey. So um, I think that's it, man. I want to I know, Sam, I'm sure you want to probably come back in. But Mateo, man, I just want to say. First and foremost, brother to brother, I love you, man. I am love beyond you, excited for you and congratulations and thank you. Um, I think you've given us a book that not only, uh, uh, it, it made me feel like I was seeing myself on a page in a way I'd never seen before, but I also feel mm. like, I also feel like I, I learned something about myself. I, I feel like I learned something about the world, obviously, that you were in uh, in your previous career. Um, and then I also was just purely like entertained at the same time. You know what I mean? And I, I think that all of those, those those feelings and being, you know, those highs and lows that we go through, I think are are, are beautiful, man. And so grateful for them and grateful for you and your stories and, and creating this, this world and creating this character uh, in, in Darren, AKA Black Buck uh, that, you, that you've given us, man. So thank you very much, bro. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for, for just being there, bro. I love you too, man. And um, if anyone wants to catch Jay, he's, you, gotta, you gotta watch Insecure's next season, all these things to figure out what happened with that baby. <laughs> <laughs> what up sam sam you about to hop back on and give some closing words for book soup thank you for hosting yes thank you all so much this was amazing i can't wait to read this book i had to mute for one second so i got no boardwalk empire spoilers but now i'm excited to see that <laughs> i'm literally watching it right now i just started it, so that's fun hey chalky fun. white <laughs> yeah, he's great. I can't wait to see more of him because I'm I'm just starting. So thank you so much, Mateo. Thank you for creating space for Sasha too. That's amazing. Thank you, Sasha, for bringing your amazing poetry here. It was, I've never heard it before and it's an honor and I am now a fan. So I can't wait to read Mateo as well. And Jay, of course, amazing to have you. Thank you so much for joining us and uplifting Mateo. This is a beautiful event. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you, audience, for being so engaged. You've all been amazing. Please, please purchase Black Bucket, the green button, and share this event with your friends. It is replayable on Crowdcast and will also be on our YouTube page. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. And thank you all for being with us. Have much a wonderful love. Day. Peace. Good night.